Hi, we'd like to thank you for joining us online today, wherever you are. If you would just join us for a moment of prayer as we head into worship. God, we just thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity to come before you to worship. God, we thank you for your presence, and we thank you for who you are. We pray these things in your name. guys, good morning. Welcome to Coastal's online service. My name is Joni. My name is Jay. We're so glad you've decided to join us today. Uh, we want to make sure if this is your first time with us to connect with you uh, by texting CONNECT to the number on the screen. Um, another way uh, that we also love to connect uh, with everyone within our church is we love to pray with you guys. Um, and every single week, our, our prayer team and our staff, uh, any requests that we receive, um, we love to be able to pray with that. So you can also text to that same number your prayer request. Yes, and we want to thank you guys so much for your gifts and your tithes and offerings. We would not be able to do the ministry that we can continue to do at Coastal without your generosity. So just a reminder, you can give a couple of ways through our Discover Coastal app or through discovercoastal.org. Yeah. 
Also want to let you know about a couple of upcoming activities that we have. Um, this coming Sunday um, is going to be November 29th. Um, we're going to do Picnic in the Park. Uh, right after Thanksgiving, come work off all of that Thanksgiving stuff that you've eaten. Uh, there will be food. Uh, we're going to have different games, corn, cornhole, kickball, different things like that. Should be a really fun time. Lindell Park, 1 p.m., November 29th. Yay, and for the kids, we are doing our pickup parade for December. So that's everything that you need to disciple your kids at home for the month of December. You can pick up your boxes at 426 Winnie from 315 to 615 on December 2nd. You can register for those on our Coastal Kids social media or through our website, discovercoastal.org. Well, Kyle Jackson is one of our church planning partners, and he has a great message for us. So y'all prepare your hearts for worship. Well, hey, Coastal. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I am joined with some of our church plant partners. And you may not know this about us, but Coastal is a church plant that has a heart for other church plants. In fact, our vision is to start an epidemic of healthy churches that spreads throughout Galveston, Galveston County, and beyond. And that's not just a, a vision statement that we put on letterhead. That's something that we really believe in and spend our time in and money in. So uh, I want you guys to meet some of our guys today. And uh, so one of the churches that we've been partnering with the longest is uh, River Point Church in Fort Worth. Uh, lead pastor is Michael Burr. So Michael, tell us what's going on in Fort Worth. Hey, Coastal family. Uh, well, what a joy it is to give you a quick update. Uh, I'm thrilled to give you this update. Actually, this last week, we just baptized three people. Um, a ton of fun. Uh, you know, in a really weird way, COVID's been good to us. <laughs> uh, our church has grown a little bit. Um, everything is going really well within our church and so with the community groups. And, um, you know, one of the visions of River Point is we realized that Fort Worth was exploding in growth. And there's one guy that's been coming. Uh, you can pray for him in Coastal Family. His name is uh, Matt. And uh, he's been coming for a while. And he moved in from uh, L.A. And uh, he's exploring Christ and, and uh, learning more about him. He's come about nine weeks. We met him off of the bike trail uh, because we're meeting outside in a parking lot next to a public bike trail in downtown Fort Worth. And so people ride just past the service. It's all open air next to the Trinity River down there. And people just ride by and they'll stop and uh, they'll come hear the message or sing a song. And then some people have stuck around. Uh, so it's just been a, it's been a big surprise. Uh, and where would we be without your prayers and your support? And so we're just so thankful for you, Coastal. No, that's awesome, Michael. We'll definitely be praying. Uh, one of our other church planters is Chris Millar. And Chris just planted in San Marcos, reaching out to Texas State students and people in that area. So Chris, tell us how things going in, in San Marcos. Yeah, it's such a unique opportunity to be here on this call uh, because about eight, maybe nine years ago now, uh, Coastal was beginning to start in, in Galveston and uh, y'all reached my wife. Uh, and, and, and my wife was baptized at Coastal uh, in y'all's first year of life. And, and that's surreal because now we're starting to baptize people here in San Marcos. And I just wonder, I wonder what God has for them, you know, five, 10 years down the road. And so, uh, yeah, we, we have quite a lot of college young adult folks and uh, probably 80% college young adults, maybe 20% community members. And, uh, and, and we've seen the Lord sustain us through COVID. Uh, I wouldn't say we're just like blowing up and everything's fantastic, but he has sustained us, and then in the past six weeks, we've seen four young guys give their life to Christ, and, and that's just been, you know, that's kind of makes it all worth it. You know, all the hard days get a lot better when you see someone go from death to life, and so uh, kind of two exciting things that I would just ask y'all to pray for is, is Ashley, my wife, gets to be a part of a ladies Bible study that started in our neighborhood, and there's about five gals that go to that that aren't Christians. Um, that just kind of popped up on our neighborhood Facebook page saying, hey, I, I need something like that in my life. And so be praying for that group and, and some of those ladies that they would give their lives to Jesus, but then also for an opportunity where I might be able, able to engage some of these husbands um, and, and perhaps start some type of men's group from there. Uh, and then actually, uh, I guess this is going to be played in the future, but uh, this Wednesday, which is 
the 18th of November, whenever this is being viewed, uh, we're having a, a Friendsgiving at our house. And we've got quite a few new neighbors that are coming to this gathering. And that'll really be their first touch point with our church in any type of formal way. And so quite a few families coming that we've been connecting with and engaging. Uh, and so just pray for kind of fruitful relationships to grow in that space. But uh, yeah, we're super pumped about what God's doing here in San Marcos and at Texas State. So yeah, thank no, you all so much for your partnership. No doubt. No doubt. That's awesome. Well, uh, on a more local level, uh, we've partnered with a couple of churches in the Texas City area. And one of that, uh, those churches is Resonate Church. Uh, Jervy Wyndham is the pastor there. So Jervy, tell us what's going on with Resonate. Well, we're excited to uh, <clears throat> to just be uh, greeting our coastal family. We always enjoy uh, hanging out and spending time with with, with you, especially uh, Pastor. You know, you've been such a huge part, and there's so many of your uh, leadership team that's just helped us and encouraged us in so many different ways. So we appreciate that. But here at Resonate Church, um, I got to say that I kind of echo what some of the uh, other planters have said um, during COVID. We've seen uh, growth, actually, uh, over 40% um, growth in our congregation. Um, as far as our missional communities and discipleship groups, um, we have missional communities and discipleship groups in like five cities throughout Galveston County now. Um, so those are expanding. Uh, this past Sunday, we did our first service in a new facility, um, you know, this past Sunday. So we're excited about that. Uh, we had one person uh, join the church. Um, we have uh, two other uh, two baptisms that uh, that we're scheduling right now. So God is just doing tremendous, tremendous things. And so we're excited about uh, the discipleship groups and mission communities that are just expanding. I mean, leaders are emerging and people are going out and actually being the church. So thank you so much for all your prayers and for all your support. That's awesome, Jeremy. I, I, I need to come drive over the causeway. And, and come visit you guys. I can't wait to see the space. So, Come on down. <laughs> Very cool. Well, uh, and then Kyle Jackson is, is planting also in the Texas City Lago Mar area at Lago Mar Church. And then Kyle is actually serving a residency uh, program with us. So he's with us every Monday at our staff meetings. And uh, we've been able to partner with him. And so Kyle, tell us where y'all are in the, the journey. Well, man, we're at the beginning part. Uh, it's good to hear from these guys and uh, hear their stories. It's encouraging. Uh, we, at the beginning of COVID, didn't even exist. Uh, we just moved to the neighborhood. But uh, through this whole season, God has been so faithful. Uh, we started small groups in September. We have three small groups, probably about 30 families joining us on a weekly basis in three different places, which is just way more than we were thinking and, and, and anticipating. We actually haven't gathered all three of those groups together, except for this past Saturday was our first time to get everyone together. We had this night of worship. We got to use some of the gear from Coastal. And um, God just moved in the midst uh, of us. We had about 50 people there at that night of worship. And one of the coolest things that was happening is some guys were helping us set up and they they have this they have a Catholic background, but they're super excited about what's going on uh, with Lagomar Church. And one of the guys was like, "Hey, what is a night of worship?" And I was like, "Oh, well, we're gonna sing some songs and we're gonna pray together." He, and he goes like, "What kind of songs? Like, like Sweet Home Alabama? Like, what kind of what are we talking about here?" And we just have so many people that are de-churched and uh, that just haven't ever really found their place uh, in a church before. And so we're really excited about walking along. Uh, with them. We actually got to do our worship service outside on the lagoon. It was super cool. And the manager of that lagoon, y'all could be praying for our relationship. She is a follower of Jesus. She's not just a, a partner with us. She's an ally and she is doing everything she can to allow us to do everything that we want to at the lagoon, which is really, really cool. So we're going to have a Christmas Eve service outside on this 12 acre lagoon in our neighborhood. It's gonna be super excited. And then invite people from that Christmas Eve service to our launch, our first ever kind of public worship service, uh, our, our church launch on January 24th. So you guys could be praying about that. God's doing some really cool stuff and we're excited to see what he has uh, continuing to do in the lives of our people here. Uh, that's, that's awesome, Kyle. 
we're we're very excited about that and and all you guys we're so thankful for what the lord is doing through you uh, in just a moment kyle is actually going to be preaching for us today so you're going to continue to hear from him but uh coastal what i want you to just to get a glimpse of what god is doing through our church and this is kind of behind the scenes stuff that sometimes you don't get to hear these stories and understand uh, when you when you give financially to coastal you get to help impact not only our church, but what the kingdom of God is doing uh, around our state and around the world. And so I'm thankful for your generosity and thankful just for your heart for the kingdom. It's, it's not just about us. It's, it's really about advancing God's kingdom. So uh, thank you guys. And Kyle, we're looking forward to hearing from you. So in college, I had this friend named Kurt, and he was crazy about this girl, Jen. We were friends with Jen's roommates, but... Jen really didn't give Kurt the time of day. So we would go over to their house and hang out and Jen was there occasionally. And so Kurt, he was always trying to get more time with Jen. So one day he calls me up, he's like, hey Kyle, I'm going to Academy to get a gun. And I was like thinking to myself, why is he getting a gun? Okay, I'll go with you. This is cool, like whatever, let's hang out. So we go to Academy, we get this gun. I'm like, hey dude, why are you getting this gun? He's like, well, we can't keep it in our dorm room, so I'm gonna have to leave it at Jen's house. And I thought, okay, that's kind of weird. He goes, no, that means I get to go visit the gun, and when I go get to visit the gun, I get to go visit Jen. And so he would go and visit this gun every day of the week. We would go over there and hang out with her roommate, and sometimes she was there, and sometimes she wasn't. And Kurt asked Jen out probably a dozen times. And she was always shooting him down. Oh, I'm in this other relationship, or oh, really, I'm not, I'm dating Jesus right now, whatever her response was. And one day she just finally gave in after his relentless pursuit, and she said yes to a date. Just one date, I'll give you one date if you just leave me alone. And Kurt was like, all right, cool, I'm gonna plan out this perfect date for Jen. And so I get to talk with him when he gets off the date, and I'm like, hey, bro, how did it go? And he was like, man, it went perfect. I'm floating on air, all of these kinds of things. And I'm like, dude, that's awesome. I'm so happy for you. Like you have been pursuing this girl for a whole semester and I couldn't be more excited for you. A couple days later, I asked Jen how it went and she was like, meh, it was okay. And I realized in that moment that even though one party might be relentless in the pursuit of a different party, sometimes everyone isn't on the same page. And I think that's what we see in this passage is that there's these people that are interacting with Jesus and Jesus is relentless in the pursuit of their heart. But sometimes, somehow, some way, they just completely missed it. So Luke 11, starting in verse 14, it says this. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. And so what I want you to see in this passage is there's three different kinds of people. Three different kinds of people that are showing up in this story, and really I think three different kinds of people that interact with Jesus. The first group are these people that were marveling at him. These are these amazed people. These people are driven by high emotion, but really low level of knowledge. They are led by their emotions. They're letting their emotions guide them, and they're really not thinking about anything else. And what I think is important for us to understand is, although we, we look at this passage and we think, hey, the people that were marveling after Jesus are actually getting it right, but what you will see later on in this text is they actually missed the point just as much as the other guys. So just because you're led by high emotion, you need to understand that when you have a low level of knowledge or information, sometimes you can be led astray by your emotion. But then there's this other group, the group that is the loudest, right? Those who are opposed. And they're driven by a, also a high level of emotion, but a high knowledge base, even a knowledge that would lead to arrogance. Both of those groups, those who are amazed and those who are opposed, are both led by a high level of emotion, but there are different types of emotion. These people who are opposed, they are just ready to erupt at anything that they think Jesus says that is wrong. They're literally sitting there on the edge of their seats waiting to bust him for something. He's literally casting out a demon and they're challenging Jesus as to how he's casting out this demon. 
So we have this group that's amazed and this group that is opposed that are really loud. But then there's this other group, right? This group that's there looking for a sign. And I would say these people are skeptical. These people um, are led by a low level of emotion. They're pretty even keel, but they're this high on knowledge and they're always looking for proof. Hey, prove this to me and I'll believe you. Prove this to me and I'll do this. And the beautiful thing about this passage is this. Although we would probably say, Jesus, just lean into those that are amazed, those people that are already on track with you and forget the skeptics, forget those to oppose, but that's not what he does at all. He looks at all of them and he brings them in. He addresses their, their needs, he addresses their worries, and he does not rebuke a single one of them because he is relentless in his pursuit of their heart. So let's look at the next passage and see how he deals with them. He gives them this counter argument. Verse 17 says this, but he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will this kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus does this beautiful picture of um, a kingdom that is at battle knowing that there are two kingdoms that are at play here, this kingdom of darkness that is led by Beelzebul or Satan and this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is bringing here on earth. He's saying the kingdom is at hand, but he's making sure that we understand and everyone that's in this story understands that even though they might not see it, there is spiritual warfare happening. And although most of this passage is dealing with Jesus interacting with this demon possession, it's not about casting out demons at all. It's about Jesus pursuing people's hearts. And so he does what's most important in the moment is he provides a logical argument to help those who are high in knowledge understand what he's doing. He says, a kingdom divided will never stand. That a kingdom that is in the midst of a civil war will never work out. It will always fall. And I think it's important for us to understand there's a couple presuppositions that we need to be aware of that he is saying about Satan or Beelzebul. The first thing is they are the same person. Beelzebul and Satan, they are one and the same. And it's important for us to understand that when he's talking about Beelzebul or Satan, he's using those words interchangeably. The second thing is that Satan is the head of a kingdom. Sometimes we forget about that. Satan is the head of a kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. And the third thing is Satan has authority over demons. They listen to what he says. So he's making this logical argument saying like, hey, Satan, um, he is the head of the kingdom. He has authority over demons. And this final argument is, is like Satan's kingdom is united. Satan is not at war at, uh, with himself. He appeals to the knowledge base of these people. And I think that's really important for us to understand that Jesus isn't God. He is also smart. He gives them this logical explanation as to, hey, how is the thread, when I pull the thread of your argument, it just begins to, to completely crumble and fall apart. But he doesn't just leave uh, the people that are dealing with emotional highs out either because he deals with those people um, in this next section where he talks about, well, Am I doing what your Jewish leaders are doing? Am I casting out demons the same way? Your sons are doing this. So if you're doing this and I'm doing this, well, if you're saying that I'm working for the Prince of Darkness, so are your sons leading, working for the Prince of Darkness. He appeals to the emotional side of things. Like, hey, your people are doing the same thing. And so if you're gonna accuse me of this, you have to accuse everyone of this if we're gonna be equal. And they begin to realize like, man, maybe this appeal doesn't hold as much weight. Maybe there's something else at play here. And he does this beautiful job of like deconstructing their argument and then presenting them the truth. And he gives them this counter argument or this alternative interpretation that the kingdom of God is at hand. 
And the Jewish people that are there, that are questioning him, that are, that are watching him, all of those people, those that are amazed, those that are opposed, and those that are skeptical would know the first five books of the Old Testament really well. They call it the Torah. Many of them might even have it memorized. And so when Jesus uses the phrase, finger of God, there would be a light bulb come off in their mind because they would be reminded of Exodus chapter 8, where Moses is pleading with Pharaoh to deliver the people of God out of his oppression. And over and over, there are these plagues that, would, that God sent on Pharaoh and, and his uh, nation uh, until they gave over the people of God. And that when they used the, this phrase, the finger of God, it would remind them of this sense of deliverance or liberation from Pharaoh. And then they would be reminded just a, a few chapters later in Exodus 31 when Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, these giant tablets that Exodus 31, 18 says that they were written with the very finger of God. So Jesus deconstructs their argument and then gives them this logical alternative interpretation as to what's going on. He's saying, hey, I am not working for Satan. That would be foolish for him to allow me to take apart his army, to take apart his kingdom if I'm working for him. No, I'm actually in opposition of him. The kingdom of heaven is at hand and it is pushing back the kingdom of darkness. And he's relentless in his pursuit of those people that are in this storyline, that are here listening to him. He doesn't push them away, whether, no matter if they're sitting high on emotion, low on uh, knowledge, whether they're high on emotion, high on knowledge, or whether they're low on emotion, high on knowledge. All three of these groups of people, he is drawing them in and saying, the kingdom of God is here. He's in your midst, and it is accessible to you. And then he goes on and challenges them in this beautiful way, starting in verse 21. He says this, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overtakes him, he takes away his armor in which he's trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest. And finding nothing, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds a house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. He gives to us this beautiful set of analogies with this kind of exhortation in the middle of it. He begins with the strong man argument. That the strong man, um, he, he, he points out the strong man has taken over something. He is, uh, he is put into uh, this palace oppress, oppression. He's taken over it and he is in charge. And these people are probably tracking along right now like, yeah, that's just what happened with this guy who was possessed by this demon. There was one that was stronger than him. The strong man had taken over him and he was mute. He was unable to speak because the prince of darkness was leading him. But then Jesus goes on to say, but there is a stronger man. And when that stronger man shows up, he cleans house. He takes, he doesn't attack the house. He attacks the oppressor that Jesus is the stronger man, and that Jesus, when he comes and fights the strong man, he will always win. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus, is that he is not threatened by Satan or his reign at all. Satan sometimes thinks that he has a hold of him, but he has never once had a hand over Jesus. Jesus is always in control. And he's always in relentless pursuit of our hearts. And what he's saying is, Hey, even though there may be a strong man here, I am always the stronger man. I will always win. I will always defeat him. And I will always deliver that which he has put in oppression and give you freedom that can only be found in Jesus. And then he goes on to this other analogy about a clean house. 
And church, I want you to think about this. Why does he do two? He kind of made his point the first time. Why does he do this clean house story? Because I believe that sometimes we forget. We forget our chains. We forget the oppression that the enemy has put us through. We forget because times are good and I'm not being tempted by all these things and we, we take our eyes off of God, and we put them on ourselves and we begin to coast through life. And that's what he's talking about. Hey, when the house is cleaned out, but it's not filled with something, man, you're in danger. You are in danger of the enemy coming back and distracting you or destroying you because your eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. They're fixed on what's going on in the world around us. They're fixed on the election. They're fixed on Facebook. They're fixed on whatever it may be, but it's not on him. And what Jesus warns us is like, hey, when you don't, when you don't, what you might could get your house in order, but when you don't invite me into this, man, you're in danger of being destroyed even worse, being held in even more captive than you were before. And sandwiched in between these two illustrations of spiritual warfare is this exhortation. You're either with me or you're against me. That's what he says. You either gather with me or you are scattering. There is no fence riding in the kingdom of God. He is saying you can either be with me Fight with me, but if you're not fighting with me, I need you to know that you are against me. Ephesians chapter two says that by nature, we are children of wrath following the prince of the power of this air. That we are naturally in opposition to Jesus and his kingdom. But the beautiful, the beautiful reality of what Jesus is inviting us into as he is relentlessly pursuing our heart is, hey, yet yeah, even though we might be in opposition to him by nature, he made a way for us through the cross. That even though we have sin in our life that leads to separation from God, and even though that separation could never be filled by any works that we may do, that Jesus came, he brought the kingdom here, and he came to die, to be a sacrifice on our behalf. And our response to that is to simply surrender our life to him. If you're not with me, he says, you're against me. But he invites us into being with him. It doesn't matter who you are in the story. You may be the person who is standing in amazement of God. And you might think you're safe there, but I want you to know is that later on in verse 27, there's a woman that stands in amazement of what Jesus is doing. And she says, blessed is the womb that bore you. And Jesus says, no, actually the person who's blessed is the person that hears my words and does them. Those that are high on emotion, those that are standing in amazement, you're not safe. We need to be rooted in the word of God. We need to be filled with him as well. And then to the skeptics, those that are looking for a sign, he's like, hey, I got a sign for you. It's not the sign you're looking for. It's the sign of Jonah, that you are going to need to repent from the sin that is in your life in order to be reconciled to me. So no matter where you are in the story, whether you're standing in amazement, whether you're in opposition because you've been burned by the church, been burned by someone who you thought was a Christian, no matter what's going on in your life, you could be standing in opposition or you could be standing in skepticism. What Jesus says is, hey, that's fine. It doesn't change the way I feel about you. I'm relentless in my pursuit of your heart. And all you have to do is come to me. So my question is this, who are you in the story? Are you one that's high on emotion, but really low on knowledge, that you're just led by whatever emotion that you might have? Or are you someone that's, yeah, I'm high on emotion, but I'm also high on knowledge, and sometimes I let something tip me over and head me in the wrong direction? Or maybe you're sitting there and you're, thinking to yourself, man, you know, right? I, I really function with a low level emotion and I have everything has to be proven to me and you're a skeptic. Where are you in this story? 
Because all three of these people were missing it. All three of these people were just like this girl, Jen, in the story. Kurt was pursuing her. He wanted everything in his whole being to be with her. And he asked her out over and over and over. He took her on this amazing date and she was like, meh. But that's not how his story ended. Because even though she didn't fall head over heels with him initially, he was relentless in his pursuit of her. And a couple years later, they got married. A couple of years later, they had babies. And now he's serving the Lord with Samaritan's Purse. It's this beautiful story of love and someone relentlessly pursuing someone who was completely oblivious to, to the, his pursuit. And we're in the same place. Oftentimes, we're completely oblivious of the pursuit that Jesus has, that he's coming for us in our hearts, and he desperately loves us, and all we need to do is just take a, a second and pause and stop scrolling and just sit and say, Man, what's distracting me from Jesus today? So here's my challenge for you. Take five minutes and just be still sometime today and look at your life and say, what's distracting me from being filled up with Jesus? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful for your pursuit of my heart. I'm so grateful for your pursuit of the people here in, in Galveston, in Galveston County, and we would be lost without your gospel. So thank you for providing a way when we had no way. Lord, for whoever may be listening here and wherever they might be, those that are stuck in uh, kind of this amazed category or this uh, like opposed category or the skeptical category, whatever we might find ourselves today, Lord, give us the ability to self-evaluate and to see where we are, our shortcomings are and be able to lean into you in our weakness. Because it is only through our weakness that we can be strengthened in you because that is what the gospel teaches us. It's in our brokenness that you have made us whole. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks, Kyle Jackson with Lago Mar Church. That was a great message. Joni, what did you have any takeaways? Yeah, I really liked that message. I really loved when at the very beginning when he was talking about Jesus's relentless pursuit of our hearts. And that is just such a cool reminder to me that no matter what, no matter what we're going through, how, we're, how we are feeling about God, Jesus is always relentlessly pursuing our hearts. And then when he brought up the three types of people who were in the crowd that day, the amazed people, the opposed people, and the skeptical people, I mean, I feel like I've been all of those people at yeah. one point in my walk with Jesus. And that's okay. Like, Jesus is still pursuing us no matter what. It's a, he said that, Jesus didn't rebuke those people who were opposed or who were skeptical. He loved them. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's really important. We, we think about the heart of the Father and just His, his heart for us. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, it should, it should drive us to Him and really wanting to be free in Him. And I think that was probably one of the, the takeaways that I took from Kyle. He, he mentioned that really the only way to experience freedom from slavery of the enemy is through repentance. Um, and it's really through confession and repentance where we're coming to the Lord. And, and we actually mentioned this, like, you know, he, he knows all of these things right. already about yeah. us, but he wants this relationship with us. Um, and it kind of, it reminded me also of, of Psalm uh, 139 towards the end there, where it just says, search me, God, and know my heart, mm -hmm. test me and my anxious thoughts. Um, see if there's any way that it's really, it's, it's offensive to the Lord, mm -hmm. you know, and then lead me in the way of everlasting. And and so really, I, I would encourage, you know, us as we're kind of ending, you know, this message to really think about that. And that was one of the things he actually encouraged us, Kyle, that is to really pray through that and kind of just get before the throne and kind of, you know, lead into prayer in that way and really let the Lord speak to us. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Y'all make sure if you're watching this on Facebook to like and share this post. Y'all have a great week and we will see you next time. Bye.